Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's real nice to be here this afternoon to share a few stories with you about what the Navajo Code Talkers were all about during World War II. I want to thank your president, Mr. Jenkins, for allowing me to be this fine institution in the United States of America, Notre Dame. It's a name that I really got stuck with ever since I saw a movie called Nuke Rockney <laughs> back in the 30s. I thought, what a university. And I also learned the only football team in the world was Notre Dame. <laughs> so I really love that story about Newt Rockney as well as the Kipper. And I also want to thank two gentlemen that have been very, very helpful through my trip up through this country. Mr. Jerry and Larry, they're sitting over here. They're both veterans, and uh, I appreciate their being helpful, including my daughter, Charity, and my son-in-law, Guillaume, and my grandson, Story. They all have been very helpful to make my trip real enjoyable and safe. I understand <clears throat> I'm supposed to speak to some faculty of this fine institution. And I look out here. So many of you, so who, I wonder who's teaching the students <laughs> with all the faculty in this room here. You know, <clears throat> it's so good to see so many interested in what the Navajo Code Talkers were all about. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, we don't fully understand the history. Someone told me that the University of Notre Dame was founded in 1800 on a piece of land don donated by some bishop. Well, I wonder who gave the land to that bishop. <laughs> because before 1400, there were over 600 of Native Americans living for thousands of years on the very ground that we're sitting here today, perhaps Potawatomi and many others. Remind me of a story that I want to tell you. After elected chairman of the Navajo Nation in 1971, the first big telephone call I got was from NASA from Houston. They wanted to use part of the Navajo Nation landscape to practice their moon mission, Apollo 15 moon mission, to two astronauts, David Scott and Jim Irwin, were to come to the Navajo land to practice their moon mission. Apollo 15. I asked them why. They said, well, the landscape on your reservation look exactly like where these two astronauts are going to land. So if you don't mind, we'd like to set up and have them practice. So I said, fine. They came, two, three, 18 wheelers showed up on reservation set up their communication with Houston, 
They even built a landing module as it would on the moon. And they had space capsule up there. And the two astronauts came out. This would be their first trip into that area. Two or three weeks before, scientists, geologists, combed that entire area, identifying all different minerals and things that they saw. And the practice was to see how many of those minerals and things that they identified would be recognized by the two astronauts as they would when they land. They only had so much time to communicate back to Houston what they really seen and identify. So that was the project. On the day, they dressed up in their space uniform and their helmet and all. A Navajo medicine man, an elder, came up to the scene. He was herding sheep nearby. He asked me, what are these two funny looking guys doing on our reservation? I said, they're going to the moon next month. They're practicing. So he thought about it and then finally said, you know, we were Navajos were once on the moon on our way to the sun. Maybe there's some Navajos still left on the moon. If these two guys are going over there, I'd like to send a message. <laughs> the astronaut asked me what they were saying. I told him. He said, okay, so here's a piece of paper. Have him write a note. And if we run into some Navajos, we'll give it to them. Well, I said, well, he said, old man, a medicine man, he never went to school, so he can't write. So then they said, well, here's a tape recorder. Have him say something into this tape recorder and tell him if we're going to run into some Navajos. We played for them. So astronauts left to practice. Medicine man and I are there. And I told him, they want you to say something into this machine. The message you want to send if there are some Navajos still on the moon. So he did. The sheep that he was grazing moved away, so he took off. Astronauts came back in after practicing a while. First thing they asked me, where's the medicine man? I said, he left. But did he leave a message on the tape? I said, yes, let's play it. So we turned it on. And this is what it said. What did he say? He said, beware of these two fellers. <laughs> they will want to make a treaty with you. <laughs> a real fine message. <clears throat> you know, at the early part of the war, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the United States was getting ready to fight back in the Pacific. Not too long, they ran into one big problem. The problem was communication. They tell us that in any war, no matter how far back you go in history, the site that has the best communication normally has the advantage in war. In our case in the Pacific, the enemy had the advantage. Why? Because they were breaking every military code that was being used by United States Marines Navy, Army, and Air Force, making it very, very difficult to strategize in this huge Pacific area where it takes 
days, sometimes even weeks, to go from point A to point B. And the enemy had all that time to break the code. And once they break your code, they know exactly where you started from, what route you're taking, and where you're going to be, what day, and what time. And they will be ready with their submarine waiting for you to arrive. Blow up your shipment of supplies, equipment, even personnel. This wasn't good at all. This was an early part of World War II in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, in January 1942, this particular situation became public knowledge. A gentleman by the name of Philip Johnston was working near San Diego, California. When he learned of this, he went over to the United States Marine Corps Marine Corps base and spoke with communication officers. Philip Johnston then suggested to these communication officers, why not use Navajo language as a code? The enemy doesn't know Navajo language. As a matter of fact, maybe only one or two other people outside the Navajo nation know the Navajo language. So it would be safe and secure. Well, Marine Corps communication officer had difficulty understanding what he's talking about. So Philip Johnson came out to the Navajo Nation in Arizona, took four Navajos down to San Diego to demonstrate what he was talking about. In February of 1942, these four Navajos and Philip Johnston demonstrated what he was talking about. They put two Navajos, one end of the building, the other two on the other end. They gave these two a message in English to send that message in Navajo to go to the other two. They wrote it down. They compared the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received. They're very much alike but not the same, similar, but to the Marine Corps communication officers. This has some possibilities. Moswell tried. So they asked the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in Washington, D.C., permission to try this suggestion made by Philip Johnston. Of course, the Commandant didn't know anything about Navajo Nation or Native Americans. So the initial response by the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps in D.C. was, no, don't do that, he said. We don't know these Indians, he said. All we know is what we see in the movies. When the Indians see a wagon train, they yell and holler right around that wagon train shooting arrows. This is not that kind of a war, so leave it alone. The Commandant also said, Marine Corps is a very proud organization. We don't want anyone wearing United States Marine Corps uniform that might embarrass this proud organization, just do the best you can. That was the initial response from the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Well, with that rejection, the enemy continued to move our direction real fast, taking strategic islands that we need in order to get closer to their homeland. Islands like Guam, Midway, Wade Island. So, more pressure on the Commandant. We need a code that the enemy would not break. 
eventually. In April of 1942, the Commandant said, okay. He said also, you got to do it my way. As you know, he said, all military code are top secret. So the project you're going to be undertaking to develop a military code using Navajo language must be top secret project. No one should know that you are working on a military code using Navajo language. That's number one. Number two, he also, the commandant also said, only recruit 30 young Navajos. Young Navajos that know English very well as well as Navajo. Don't tell them what you're gonna do with them. Just ask them if they want to fight the war in the Pacific and shoot the enemy with rifle, not arrows. Also, don't <clears throat> tell them anything about the project. It's got to be top secret. We don't know whether these Navajo young men can become United States Marines. So it's got to be top secret. Just recruit them just like you do all other Marines. Process them through boot camp. And if they pass boot camp, process them through combat training, like all other Marines. And if they pass combat training, process them through Marine Corps Communication School at Camp Pendleton near Oceanside, California. And if they pass Marine Corps Communication School, like all other Marines who wants to be in Marine Corps Communication Unit, then separate them and go have them go through Marine Corps Navajo Communication School that you will set up as a top secret operation. With that authorization, Marine came out to the Navajo Nation in May of 1942 to recruit 30 young Navajos, as suggested by the Commandant. On the reservation, the recruiters start talking to Navajo kids. And they ask them if they want to join Marines, fight the war in the Pacific. They all say, yes. You want to join the United States Marine and wear a nice blue uniform like this, you know, all of that. And they all say, yes. Nothing about the code. Just the fact that do you want to join the United States Marine, fight the war in the Pacific. So they all volunteered, said yes. They gave them preliminary physical exam, one drop out. So 29 were then bussed down to San Diego, Marine Corps base, to go through boot camp, just like all other Marines that were going through boot camp at that time. Well, at the end of boot camp, they grade each platoon going through boot camp. The 29 young Navajos were made into one platoon. Well, there were several other platoons all going through boot camp. At the end, each platoons are graded. The best one, number one, next one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Navajo platoon came out number one of all platoons that were at Gothrone Boot Camp. This went back to the Commandant. Of course, the Commandant was elated and very happy and said, wonderful. Now process them through combat training and see what they do. Same thing. These 29 young Navajos went through combat training 
and they came out, all of them, either experts or sharpshooters with all the weapons that were being used at that time. Again, the commandant was all happy. Process them through communication school, see what they do. Again, there at Marine Corps Communication School, that's where they teach us how to use different communication equipment that was in use at that time. How to make minor repairs out in the field. They also taught us Navy semaphore signals. We didn't know what was going on, of course. We thought this is what everybody goes through to be a Marine. They also taught us how to string telephone lines from coconut trees to coconut trees. Also, they taught us Morse code. Morse code was very much part of United States Marine Corps communication. They don't use those anymore, Morse code. But if you watch a Class B movies, a train shows up at the station. There's a clerk there with a cap with a green bill. He's tapping on something that went like da did it did it da da did it did it da da did it. That's Morse code. But they taught us that too. So these 29 young Navajos going through the communication school in May of 1942 pass all of that. They were then separated from all other Marines, put on a bus, 29 of them. United States Marine Corps Colonel, a full bird colonel, now took charge of these 29 young Navajos. They bust them down to east side of San Diego, near a place called Camp Elliott, the top secret location. There was a building about three times the size of this area here. And a high fence around that building like a prison. There's a gate. At the gate, there are two guards. And over the gate, there's a big sign that said, top secret operation, keep out. Through that gate, these 29 young Navajos processed by Marine Corps colonel into a classroom about twice the size of this area here. In that classroom were tables with four chairs around those tables. In front of each chair, a writing tablet, a pencil. There was a blackboard with chalk and eraser. Colonel then addressed these 29 young Navajos, Marines now. He said, gentlemen, have a seat. You are Marines now. You're ready to go fight the war in the Pacific. But before you do that, we'd like for you to do something else first. We want you to develop a military code using your language. Mind you, this is the first time they learned that they were recruited to develop a military code using Navajo language. What a surprise. Next words coming out of the colonel's mouth was, this is a top secret project. No one knows you're here. Whatever you do in this classroom is also very top secret. Whatever code words you can be developing, you write it down on your notepads. Everything you do in this classroom stays in the classroom. At the end of the day, before you go back out the gate to your barracks, we can gather all this work you've done, put it in a file under lock and key. 
before you go back out that gate every day, you're going to be searched from your toes to the top of your head, making sure you don't take anything out of this top secret classroom. No one knows you're here. We want to keep it that way. So when you go back to your barracks, don't tell anyone what you are doing here, top secret. A lot of instruction of what the project is all about. Most importantly, it's a top secret project. Number two, whatever code you're going to be developing in Navajo language, only you would know what those code words represent. Another Navajo, not in this top secret classroom, here you use the code words, should have absolutely no idea what in the world you are talking about. That's the kind of code we want. Only you would know, not another Navajo who's not in this top secret classroom should know what those code words represent. With a lot of instruction, the colonel then said, here's a sample military messages sent in combat. Look at it, read it, and see how you can send messages like this using the code you're going to be developing. The colonel sat down, lit his pipe, and said, gentlemen, go to work. I think about that quite a bit. If I was one of those 29 back in 1942, what would I be thinking? I'd probably say to the next guy sitting to me, hey guy, looks like we made a mistake here. <laughs> we joined the Marines to fight the war in the Pacific, and what's this coat business? And top secret stuff. Well, like all good Marines, you have to obey what the officer says. So they got up to start looking at these sample messages. They were all written in English language, using the English alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F. This presented the first big problem for these 29 young Navajos. Why? because Navajo is not a written language. Therefore, we don't have, Navajos don't have words for letters like A, B, C, D, E, F. How in the world are you gonna send something you don't even have words for? So as they sit in there scratching their heads, say, what do we do? Well, one of them went to the blackboard wrote down a big letter A and said, since only we would know what these Navajo code words represent, let's call the letter A Belasana. Belasana in Navajo means apple. Okay, they all agreed that Belasana or apple in Navajo would represent letter A. How about letter B? Shush. Shush in Navajo means bear. <clears throat> How about letter C? Masse. Masse in Navajo means cat, C-A-T. How about letter D? B. B in Navajo means steer, D-E-E-R. You see what they were doing? They were selecting Navajo words that they were very familiar with, easy to remember, because they were told everything that they are creating will be subject to memory only. They cannot take any notes out into battlefield with them with message codes, because if you get shot, the enemy is going to search you, and if they find that note, There'd be one way 
they're going to break your code. So you don't take any kind of notes out into battle. All code words you develop will be subject to memory only. So the first thing they did is to create code words for all the letters of the English alphabet. Going down the line, some words, they had difficulty agreeing what to call, like the letter J. Eventually, they decided to call the letter J Telechuki. Telechuki in Navajo means jackass. <laughs> Easy to remember. We had a lot of jackasses on the reservation <laughs> back in those days. We use them to haul water or wood. Sometimes we write them to manage all the animals that we were charged with. All the way down to Z, letter Z. Beshtotlish. Beshtotlish in Navajo means zinc. We have zinc on Navajo. It's part of our ceremonial things that we use. So now, these 29 are Navajos created code words for all the letters of the English alphabet written down on their tablet, memorized. Every Friday there would be a test. They divide the group into two, group A and group B. Group A is given a, a message containing code words that are developed and memorized. Send that message to group B they write it down in English. They compare the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received, to see how closely the two messages are beginning to look exactly alike, testing our memory of the code words. Every Friday test, every day search, every day creating code words, all through the month of June, 1942. By the end of June 1942, 260 code words were developed, <clears throat> memorized. The colonel then said, let's quit here. We're going to have a final test. Group A, group B. Group A is given a long message in English, to send that message in Navajo code to group B. They wrote it down in English. They compared the two messages, the one that was sent, the one that was received. By golly, they both look exactly alike, with one exception, punctuation marks, back to the classroom to create code words for punctuation marks. A period, no problem, decision. Decision in Navajo means a black dot. Semicolon took a little time to create code word for it, but eventually they called semicolon decision, but said not dead. In Navajo means a black dot that lost its tail. That would be the code word for semicolon. Question mark. Acha. Acha in Navajo means ears. Question mark looks like an ear. All the punctuation marks you could think of. Code words were developed, memorized. Back to final test, group A, group B. Group A is given a law message containing most all of the code words that were developed, sent to group B. They wrote it down in English. They compared the two. By golly, it's exactly like punctuation and all. As a matter of fact, it looks like a Xerox copy of the one that was sent. At this juncture, the colonel said, gentlemen, we finish here. We're going to test this code that you just developed in actual battle. 
to see how your memory works under enemy fire. So 13 of that 29 young Navajos in the middle of July 1942 were sent overseas to join the 1st Marine Division. 1st Marine Division was in Australia, getting ready to go on the first offensive movement in the Pacific. August 7, 1942. 77 years ago. So if you're not 77 years old, you have not been born yet then. But if you're older than 72, well, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, August 7, 1942. First Marine Division landed on the beaches of Guadalcanal with 13 Navajo coat talkers to test the coat that had, they had just developed under enemy fire and see how it works. Three weeks after the landing on Guadalcanal, General Van de Griff commander of the 1st Marine Division, who had just landed on the beaches of Guadalcanal, sent work back to the United States, saying, this Navajo code is terrific, he said. The enemy never understood it. We don't understand it either, he said. <laughs> but it works. Send us some more Navajos. That got back to the Commandant. Commandant, of course, was very elated and ordered San Diego Marine Corps base to take charge of this new military code developed by 29 young Navajos, 260 code words. That's how the code was developed, how it was tested on the Battle of Guadalcanal, the first landing in the Pacific. After that, Navajo Code became official United States military code to be used in every landing for all top secret confidential messages. Messages you don't want the enemy to know went through Navajo Communication Network. Every landing, Marine and Navy establishes two communication network, Navajo communication network for all top secret confidential messages. Messages you don't want the enemy to know went through Navajo network. The second communication network was English for all other messages. Messaging you don't care if the enemy breaks the code or understand what you're talking about went through English network. These two communication networks were used every landing in the Pacific. After Guadalcanal, Bougainville, after Bougainville, Cape Cluster, after that, New Britain, Tarawa, Macon, Tarawa, Kowachalan, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Hassan Guam, after Guam, Peleliu, a real bad island. After Peleliu, Iwo Jima, another bad one. After Iwo, Okinawa. After Okinawa, some of us ended up in North China. First Marine Division and Sixth Marine Division were sent into North China because the Japanese, close to a million soldiers, 
in Manchuria didn't want to surrender. So they sent us in there to get them to surrender. Even though the emperor had surrendered, peace treaty was signed on a battleship Missouri in September. The Japanese in North China are still fighting. So we went up there, got them to surrender eventually. October 25, 1945, we had a separate peace treaty ceremony with them at Tsingtao, China. That's sort of a brief history of what Navajo code talkers were all about. Like I said, it was used in every landing. In every landing, these two communication network, Navajo and English, work side by side, everywhere. The front line, beach command post, inside the command ship. Usually command ship is a battleship where the general and the admirals are directing their landing operation inside the communication room of that battleship. Two communication network inside there. Around one table sit about five of us Navajo code talkers. Navy assigns us runners to stand behind each one of us 24 hours a day until the island is secure. Another table right next to us, around that table sits blonde-haired, blue-eyed guys. They are in charge of the English network. Navajo and English network together everywhere on most of the ships that are being used in the landing. Navajo and English network in those ships. Battle ships. Cruisers, destroyers, even submarines had these two communication network. Aircraft carrier, marine air wing, marine tank units, marine artillery all have these two communication network. So after the first fire is shot on the island, communication starts going everywhere. Navajo as well as English. When they start coming in, those of us who are assigned to the command ship around their table, when we get the message coming in in Navajo, we write it down in English, hand it over our shoulder to the runner that's standing behind us. He takes it up to the bridge, gives it to the general or the admiral. They read the message, they respond. A runner brings it back down. If on top of that message, it says, Arizona, New Mexico, we send it back out in Navajo code, wherever it is intended. If it doesn't have New Mexico, Arizona, it goes to the next table. The blonde hair, blue eyed guy sent that message in English. These two networks working 24 hours a day until the island is secured. Every location, the beach command posts have about five or six Navajo code talkers. Regimental units, battalion, all have Navajo and English network with them to provide the communication. How does it sound? Well, let's go to Iwo Jima. Most people are familiar with the landing on Iwo. Three Marine Division landed on Iwo, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, February 1945. 3rd Marine Division down on the south end, Mount Surabachi. 4th down the middle, the 5th on the north side. There are some little hills on the north side. A company of Marines on the north side was in deep trouble. They were being fired upon from three different directions. Motor shells were being dropped on them. They were desperately hunkering down in their foxhole. Company commanders scribbled a note 
a message asking for help, gave it to Navajo Code Talker, assigned to that unit for the front line. He then sent that message to Beach Command Post, asking for help. And I'm going to recite that for you. That message that was sent on Iwo, a copy of that is the Marine Corps Archives in Washington, D.C. If you ever go to Washington, D.C., go to Marine Corps Archives and look for that message that was sent in Navajo Code as an example. Here's what the code talker that sent that message said in Navajo Code. The pe anna achi pi dat is trahi de na son se tangi to chen si da tsa tra astra na ki shash. I know you didn't understand what I said unless you're Navajo. But let's say if that message was broadcast to the Navajo people, what would they have heard this Navajo code talker say asking for help? This is exactly what they would have heard in Navajo. Sheep. Eyes, nose, deer, destroyer, tea, mouse, turkey, onion, sick horse, three, six, two, bear. Asking for help? <laughs> Just a bunch of never whole words. Sheep, eyes, nose, deer, sick horse. Well, the code talker receiving this message at Beach Command Post. What did he write down? As each Navajo code word comes through the air, he writes it down in English. This is what he wrote down. Not sheep, eyes, no, sick horse, no. He wrote down, send demolition team to Hill 362B. That was the message. The problem was beneath the hill, 362B. There were three hills on the north side, 362A, 362B, and 362C. Beneath 362B was the problem. That message in Navajo Code took 20 seconds. Immediately after 20 seconds, Beach Command Post organized a rescue team to save that company of Marines. And, and, a, and like I said, after 20 seconds, tanks with flamethrowers, another heavy unit was sent out there. If that same message was sent in English code, 30 minutes, 30 minutes in English code, 20 seconds in Navajo code. A big difference. Those guys didn't have 30 minutes. That's why Marines and Navy really love Navajo code because it's fast, it's secure. Why 20 seconds? You probably wonder, it's the same message. 20 seconds in Navajo code, 30 minutes in English code. If you're gonna code something in English, an officer gives you a message to send in English code. Besides our radio equipment that we carry, there's another unit that all of us carry. It's called scrambling and descrambling machine. If you're gonna send something in English code, you scramble the message first. So if an officer gives you a message to send, you turn on your scrambling machine, take the first letter of that message, feed it into your scrambling machine, press a button, take the next letter of that message, feed it into your scrambling machine, press a button, 
one at a time, all the way through the message. When you finish, you press the big button, out comes that message, scramble. That's the one you sent over the air to the English network, guys. They write it down in scramble form. They then turn on their de-scrambling machine. Take the first letter of that scramble message, feed it into the de-scrambling machine, press a button. Take the next letter, feed it into your de-scrambling machine, one at a time, all day long till you finish it. You press the big button, out comes that message, hopefully the way it was written. Because there's too much pressing this and pressing that. Sometimes you press the wrong button and not all the message will come out. 30 minutes doing that, 20 seconds in Navajo. That's why, as I said, they always said Navajo code was the best weapon used in the Pacific because it was safe, it was fast. Major Howard Connor, 5th Marine Division communication officer, wrote his report to his superior in the message report of Major Howard Connor of 5th Marine Division, said the first 48 hours of Iwo Jima landing, over 800 messages were sent in Navajo code the first 48 hours. That's just one division. There were two other divisions had similar Navajo code traffic. Each division had at least 80 Navajo code talkers assigned. So the 5th Marine Division had 800 messages the first 48 hours, the other two Division had similar Navajo code traffic. So you multiply 800 times three, you get over 2,000 Navajo messages the first 48 hours on, Navajo, on Iwo Jima landing. You do a little math, that means Navajo code going through the air every minute nonstop for 48 hours. In Major Connor's report, by the way, that report is also Marine Corps archives. When you get there, look for Major Connor's report. It's all written in there, what I'm telling you. Major Connor said, without Navajo, Marines would never have taken the island of Iwo Jima. That's how critical Navajo code was to all the landing in the Pacific. That's why Navajo code remained top secret for a long, long time. After the war ended, we were told not to tell anyone what we did. They said, if someone asks you, what did you do in the war? Just tell them you were radio man, that's all. Nothing more. So when we came home, sure enough, people asked, hey, what did you do in the war? Our answer, oh, nothing. I was just a radio man. Don't ask me any more questions. <laughs> that was our answer for 23 years. It was not until 1968 Navajo Code was declassified. And only after that, we're allowed to talk about it. But most of us just put the whole thing behind us. Just be radio man for 23 years, that's all. All of a sudden, on television, newspapers, says never hold code, declassified. People start asking questions. Then we decided, well, look, let's reflect back and see what it is that we actually did. And more report, like the one I just told you about, Major Connor's report. More report like that was coming forward about what the Navajo Code was 
and how effective it was. Well, here we are today. Over 400 of us were certified as Navajo Code Talkers. Today, only five of us are still alive. The oldest one still alive is 96 years old. The youngest one still alive today will be 91 years old next month. That's me, Peter McDonald. Thank you. I joined when I was 15 years old. Yes, I lied about my age. <laughs> Why? Because my older cousin, with whom I used to play around, herd sheep on the Navajo Nation, he went in because early 1943, because he was older than I am. He came home wearing that beautiful Marine Corps blue uniform. I asked Tom, hey, how do I get one of those? He said, join the Marines. I want to do that, I told him. Well, he said, how old are you? I said, I'm 15. He said, uh-uh, can't do that. You got to be at least 17. I said, they don't know. Well, he said, no matter what, you got to be 17. So, I went to a Marine Corps recruiting office, Farmington, New Mexico, and asked the recruiter, I want to join the Marine. He looks at me and says, how old are you? I said, I'm 17. Where's your birth certificate? I said, I don't have one. I was born out in the boondocks. We we're moving our sheep from winter headquarters to our summer headquarters. We we're moving our animals along the way. And my mother, she, she went into labor. So they have to quickly pitch a tent, set a big pole, tie a sesh belt for her to hang on to. She says, we laid a goat skin on, on the dirt floor and you fell out on that goat skin. So I don't have birth certificate because I wasn't born in the hospital, I was just on the boondocks. Well, the, office, the recruiter said, you gotta have someone there watch for you, that you are 17 years old. I said, here, my cousin, <laughs> he's a Marine. He signed that I was 17. That's how I joined the United States Marine Corps at age 15 years old. The sad part of the story is after Guam, the next battle was Peleliu. Tom and about a dozen other code talkers were assigned to land with the first wave on the island of Peleliu, September 15, 1944. 8.30 in the morning, the sky was clear, sun beating down on the island, 100 degrees at 8.30 on the beach. At noon, the temperature went up to 115. Every landing, they always assign at least a dozen Navajo code talkers to land with the first wave. Every landing. And in this landing, September 15, Tom was one of them to land with the first wave. Why do they do that? Because the command ship wants to know as soon as the first wave hit the beach, what the casualty rate is on the beach. You don't want the enemy to know that. 
So that kind of information had to be sent back to the command ship in Navajo code. Command ship also want to know where the enemy fires are coming from. They give us a map before the landing to memorize. So if you're assigned to land with the first wave, they tell us as soon as the gate goes down, run la hell, hit the deck, and see where the enemy fire is coming from. Look at your map. Give the coordinates. Send it back to the command ship where the enemy fire gun emplacement is. Then the command ship will order another battleship marine air wing in Navajo code to knock out that particular gun emplacement. You don't want to send that in English because they're breaking code. As soon as they find out they are being targeted, they move their gun position. So by the time you get it all set up to knock them out, they're not there anymore. So it's important that those kind of messages all handle in Navajo code. So they never know that they are being targeted. That's why the first wave, always at least a dozen Navajo code talkers assigned to land with the first wave. Tom was one of them. After the gate went down with the first wave, it's always over a thousand with the first wave. It was bad. After Tom took about 10 steps away from the landing craft on the beach, enemy machine gun went across here. His head fell off. His body fell forward. They're yelling and screaming all along the beach. Corman, Corman. That's war. Father, they lost a life to be a grandfather like me. Why? Think about it. Because we love this country. That's why. We don't want the ugliness of war to ever be felt by our own parents, our relatives. We want to keep it away. We love this country. That's why we do that. It's tough. If you're a veteran, have been through this, you know what I'm talking about. The five of us that's still alive, as old as we are, 96 and 91 very shortly, we get together and we say, looks like there might be another war. What do we do? One of the, the 96 year old one says, give me a rifle, I'm ready to head out again. Patriotism. We don't want our parents, our relatives, to feel the ugliness of war. More than that, we also cherish our freedom and liberty. That means a lot. That's why it's important to say thank you to all veterans of all wars, even those who are gone, like Tom. Someone said, our flag, United States, America's flag, 
does not fly because the wind blows it. It flies with the last breath of thousands of soldiers who have died defending their flag. Think about that. It's the last breath of those who died defending their flag that makes our flag wave. Every time I see a flag waving, tears come to my eyes thinking about Tom and many others who gave up their life to defend the American flag, representing United States of America, representing our land, representing the freedom and liberty that we all have and enjoy today. So please, respect the flag, no matter where you are. Yes, salute the flag. Put your heart, hand over your heart and say the Pledge of Allegiance. It means something to those who defend it, for those who die and never came home defending it. That's us, America. We, the five of us Navajo Code Talkers, are working on the Navajo Code Talker Museum. This unique legacy of World War II need to be preserved, we believe. Why? Because we believe what we did truly represents who we are as Americans. You see, we all know America is a diverse community. And we say that. Different languages, different skills, different talents, different nationality. That's America. And when our way of life is threatened, things we cherish most, like our freedom and liberty, we all come together from our diverse position and become one. And when we become one, we're invincible. We cannot be defeated. We'll always have the freedom and liberty that we all cherish. That's what we believe a diverse community truly means. As a result, we decided to build a museum to illustrate to our children, your children, our grandchildren, your grandchildren, to go through the Navajo Code Talker Museum and tell the story of how it is that we each, how much, many ways that we are diverse, makes us strong if we come together as one to protect that what is most precious to all of us, our freedom and liberty. Thank you very much for listening to me.